So I'll, I'll, I'll admit I, w I was uh, I, ooh. Yeah, center. I was outside chit-chatting while y'all started the service. I don't know if they said why Tammy wasn't here. Did y'all say that? No, <laughs> excellent. Uh, so we're, Tam Tammy's up in the booth. Hey, Tammy. Don't say hi, don't worry. Anyhow, she, she's up in the booth. Our worship director's up in the booth because in about three weeks, uh, we're going to start live streaming the service. We'll be, uh, so if you can't make... There's someone who wants to sleep in. <laughs> we're going to start live streaming the service. Uh, I think we'll be able to live stream the music as well. Am I right on that? Is that kind of the new... Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, we'll be able to live stream the whole service. Uh, but she's up there making sure we got all starting to get all some of the technical <laughs> stuff uh, worked out uh, on that. So uh, just kind of telling you that. We're doing this series. Uh, we're talking about our core DNA. This is who we are at First United. This is what we're all about, all that kind of stuff. Looking to make sure, just, just like the DNA in your body is in your every cell that you have, and, and it impacts you, it defines who you are, so that we understand that the DNA of our church, this is who we are, this is what we're about, this is who, at the core of First United, that it's in every aspect we do. And, and some folks think we're doing this series because we're talking about doing the Western expansion. And yeah, we want, when we go out West, we want to kind of Western expansion, we want to have that core DNA of this is us out there, but it's also every ministry, everything we do, all that we're about should be impacted by this is our, our, who we are. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at it. If you haven't been in the services and you want to see it, you can go online uh, and check it out in the next few weeks. Um, you can uh, live stream it uh, kind of thing. But uh, we talked the first week, we talked about Discover Hope, that God loves you. Okay, some of y'all are getting that. Some of you are still trying to figure it out. But God loves you, period. That's discover hope. When you accept God's love, accept God's grace, God loves you no matter what. You can't stop God from loving you. And that's kind of the message we want the world to know is that God loves you. And then we talked about last week that because God loves you, period, and now what are you going to do? And we talked about deep in faith. How are you taking it? How you know that God loves you, period. Now work out your faith. Work out your salvation. Uh, and we talked about, you know, is, is, it, is it my faith in my works or is it God? Yes, do something. Well, we're going to get to that today because that's what I want to talk about today. Kind of that core DNA thing about us is that uh, we want to demonstrate love. Because God loves you, um, how are you demonstrating love to the world around you? How are you sharing God's love? One of the things we talk about at the church and in our values is how are you sharing God's love in your sphere of influence? And that's kind of in some of our core values, sphere of influence. And, and, and there are smart people in the church. So I'm not one of them because I look at sphere of influence and think, I don't know what this means. How do I share God's love? How did I demonstrate God's love in my sphere of influence until somebody said Publix? Yes, because Wednesday night when I, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, it was my night to cook at, at the house. And so I was cooking dinner at the house and we had no vegetables. And even I know that if I create a dinner in, without vegetables and my wife sits down, there's going to be a conversation about why are there no vegetables. So I went to public. I had a meeting. I had to be at church at 630. I went to public a little after five to go get vegetables. I had to get three things. I had to get that spray on stuff for the, so stuff doesn't stick to the pan, whatever that's called. Uh, I know at Pam, but we buy the cheaper version. We buy the Publix version, so the cheap version of that. I had to get spray and starch so my shirt would look clean for y'all. And then I had to get vegetables. And I should get in and get out of Publix. Evidently, all of Ormond Beach decided 5 p.m., is the right time to go to the trail shopping plaza. And I get to the line with my three things, and even the 10-item line had like 15 people in it. There are lines everywhere, and you hear the guy on the little thing going, we need all cashiers up front, please, all cashiers up front. And I got stuck in the, I, got, I was just in a bad spot because people were fanning out to the ones that, <laughs> the whole time my brain's going, Demonstrate love, demonstrate love, demonstrate love, demonstrate love, you know, try, you know, not go, really? You know, to watch the person. <laughs> in your sphere of influence, when you're interacting with people, when you're having conversations with people, in your job, in your life, in whatever you're doing, are you kind of demonstrating love to the people around you? That are, are you letting them know? Are you, are you showing them? Not Maybe not even using words, but just how you live, just how you act. Are you demonstrating love and you're like, well, I don't know what to do. Just do something. Right? And that's the FSU football tagline. <laughs> and it is not going well. Maybe it should just be do anything, right? I, you know, just do, do. But, but we get so busy. I, well, maybe it's not just do. Maybe it's not just do anything. I mean, you need to be faithful to who you are. 
When it comes to sharing God's love, when it comes to demonstrating God's love, you can't be something you're not. It needs to be something you're passionate about, something you're energized about, something that brings... For me, uh, Monday, I went, I went to camp. I preached at camp. There were youth directors and children's ministers, and they called me and said, hey, can you come preach at camp? I'm like, yes. And I'm, they're like, how much do you need to get paid to come? I'm like, I'll pay you all. I just love going to camp to preach, right? And I said that, and some of the other preachers were like, you need to, you need to get, send them a, you know, you need to get paid to come do this because we get paid to come do this, and it makes us look bad. I'm like... Oh, I'll pay them if they'll just let me come <laughs> preach here, right? Because it's something I'm passionate about. It's something I love. And so you need to figure out what, you, what it is within you what, that you want to do, that this, this is how I can share God's love and, and God's grace and all that kind of stuff. You're like, ah, I just don't know what to do. Just do something. Maybe Nike has it right. Just do it. Because we spend so much time going, well, let me see. I can do this. Well, I want, what does God want me to do? We spend all this time thinking and praying, and we'll get back, hold on, thinking and praying and pondering and worrying and stressing and figuring out that all we do is come on Sunday morning, sit on our butts and go home. I mean, just do one, just do something. And if you could do, and some of you are like, yeah, but I don't, what if I fail? I mean, what if, I mean, really, do you think you're going to screw God's love up where God goes, well, now I'm done, let's just destroy everything. We, we sit down and we're so afraid we're going to mess up that we never do anything. But if, but if, right now, just for you to think about, if you could do anything to demonstrate God's love in the Ormond Beach area or beyond, if you want to go beyond, or in the 386, I mean, maybe, maybe you feel like you need to demonstrate God's love in India, and uh, we'll pray for you and send you on your way. But in, in your sphere of influence, if you could do one thing, what's one thing you do to demonstrate love to the community? What's one thing you do in your sphere of influence where you could share God's love with the community and say, hey, because God loves me, period, here. Right? You kind of got that? So why aren't you doing it? I mean, what's, what's your... I just, so I'm going to read to you a story. It's, it's probably my favorite story in the Bible because it's violent and all that good stuff. And I'm going to read it to you because I love the Old Testament. It, and if you've never read through the Old Testament, we did that. And I know a lot of people don't like the Old Testament, but, we, but you love Game of Thrones. So the Old Testament is Game of Thrones with Jesus and God involved. So it's good stuff. In 1 Samuel 13, there's an issue. So here's the issue. Saul and his son Jonathan and the men were staying at Gibeah in Benjamin. And the Philistines were camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One towards Ophrah in the vicinity of Shemal. The other towards Beth Haran. And the third towards the borderland in the valley of Zebio facing the desert. They don't name things normal back then, but anyhow. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel. Because the Philistines had said, otherwise the Hebrews will make swords and spears. So all of Israel's went down to the Philistines to have their plow. So in other words, they're saying, look, we don't have a blacksmith in town to make a sword. And it gets down here into verse 22. Says, so on the day of battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. So that's not good. Now, there, there's evidently a battle that needs to take place. This battle is going to happen at a place called Michmash. It's actually a battle, if you ever watch uh, the History Channel, and I highly recommend the History Channel. They've done a study of this battle on the History Channel, uh, the Battle of Michmash. But anyhow, it says, One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So it must have been a teenager. So... If, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeon under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ajahah wearing an ephod, the son of Ichabod's brother, Atahibab, a son of Phinehas, the son of Eli. Y'all are laughing. Y'all don't know how to pronounce the names either. The Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, the other Sanah. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, the other to the south towards Giba. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost to those uncircumcised fellows. That's Hebrew smack talk right there. That's, that's like them doing a the little gator chomp thing, uh, all right, as you're going into the stadium, all right? Let's go talk to those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or few. Now, that's the verse everybody reads, and that's the verse everybody remembers, so we're going to come back to that verse. Nothing can stop the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. And Jonathan said, come then, 
we will cross over toward the men and let them see us. If they say, wait there until we come down to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be the sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistines. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes we're hiding in. That's Philistine smack talk. So they're doing the war chant back at them, right? So you got this going on. The men in the outpost uh, shouted to Jonathan, come up and we will teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his, right, using his hands and his feet, which that's just a strange line. How else was he going to climb up? <laughs> climb up using his hands and his feet. Evidently, they're letting you know, there were no elevators there in that time period. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about a half acre. Then panic struck the whole army and those in the camp and the field and the outpost. And, it was, and all around them shook. It was a panic sent by God. And then Saul's army heard about it, saw what was happening, said, let's go over there and join, and a rout takes place. I love this story. Let me tell you why. You're called to demonstrate love, right? Okay, let me ask that again. You're called to demonstrate love, right? Yes. In your sphere of influence. Yes. You're supposed to do something. Yes. Okay. But you have no plan. Perfect. Because that's Jonathan. All right, first off, there's not a sword in town, right? They don't have a sword. So they're, they're supposed to fight an army, and they don't have swords. Now, everything's in place to fight, because when they go through that saw and that list of all those people, you're laughing at me because I can't say their names. Well, that's sort of the Bible author telling you everything's in place to do what we're supposed to do, except for we don't have any swords. And the reason they don't have any swords... It's because they didn't have a blacksmith. See, there's a time period thing going on here. They're moving from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. And Israel's still kind of in the Bronze Age. And the Philistines are in the Iron Age. The Philistines have blacksmiths. They know how to forge swords. The, uh, the Israelites are in the Iron Age. They don't know how to forge swords with iron. So bronze sword loses. So they're technologically behind. And they don't have the resources they need to do what they need to do. Did you hear that? They don't have what they need to do what they need to do. And then Jonathan's plan is, let's go. And the armor bearer goes, okay. Now we need to give the armor bearer a lot of credit. Because you know what an armor bearer does? Carries the one weapon until the battle starts. And he goes, here. <laughs> and he's like, let's go. And Jonathan's like, yes. Perhaps the Lord will save us. Because nothing will stop the Lord from saving whether by many or few. And we love that line. Nothing's going to stop God from saving us. That is not what Jonathan says. Jonathan says nothing will... Uh, well, Jonathan goes, perhaps the Lord will save us. You never see that on a t Christian t-shirt. Jesus saves. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, we're always like, oh, no, nothing's going to stop the Lord from saving. Jonathan's like, I don't know, man. This, I, I know I'm supposed to do this. He has no guarantee of success. There, there's not a moment where God's gone, hey, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan. Maybe God's a little bit like Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Jonathan, I need you to do this. And I'm going to be with you. And it's going to be tough, a little challenging, but we'll get through, buddy. There's no moment. Of, there's no burning bush. There's no voice from heaven. There's none of that. Jonathan is just like, we're supposed to. I know we're supposed to be doing this. We should be doing something. Let's go and and. What if God, what, what if you are so busy trying to figure out what God wants you to do? God just wants you to do something. And that really, if you're called to demonstrate love, you should go until you get a no. What if instead of waiting for a yes, you go until you get a no? I need this sucker planned out, all right? And Jonathan's like, all right, let's go. And so Jonathan has a plan, and it's horrible. Jonathan's plan is, let's let them see us. Now, I have never been in the military. I've never, I've never served in anything like that. I've played a lot of Call of Duty on Xbox. So, I still know that in military maneuvers, the number one goal is don't be seen. Especially when you're outnumbered and outmanned and outgunned. Sneak attack. And Jonathan's plan is, let them see us. And we're clearly told... 
the Philistines have the high ground. Even today in military maneuvers, high ground wins. Okay, so everything's against them. And Jonathan's plan is, hey, let's just jump out there and see what happens. We're going to tell them to see us. And if they say, hey, come on up, we'll know it's our day. No. The right answer would be, come on down, because it's easier. Except for once again, I think Jonathan is reminding us that the way of being faithful to God is never easy. And we're looking for the simple, the quick. And sometimes God is the harder route is the best route. Like, come on up. And like, and Phil's like, all right. You got to love the armor bearer, though. Because in verse Chapter 14, verse 7, Jonathan's like, all right, this is the plan. And the armor bearer's going, you're nuts, man. That's just, <laughs> that's not recorded in the story, but I guarantee the armor bearer's like, mm, this is not a good idea. And the armor bearer's, nope, I'm with you. Let's go, buddy. Uh, that's something I think is important. When you're called to demonstrate love, who are you doing it with? Who, who are you sharing love with in a way that you're not by yourself? Um, I, 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 for me, I'm, I'm a lot more cocky when I'm in a group of people. I have a lot more confidence, right? E even even uh, if, it's, if it's just my wife and she and I, well, she will talk to a fence post so, and make friends with it. <laughs> but when she's with me, man, we'll, we'll engage people constantly, right? We, when it comes to doing ministry, we're not called to do it alone. Moses had Aaron right? David had Jonathan. In this story, Jonathan has the armor bearer. Even the lone ranger had... So how is he the lone ranger? <laughs> no, he's the lone ranger. We're, we're lone ranger. Even the lone ranger had Tonto. Yeah, well, sometimes, sometimes we need that person to, to go with us and, and to be with us. And, and I, I, part of this ties into this week. In my, I, was pre, I had to preach on, on Monday about the importance of being in ministry together, being a covenant group. And then I, actually yesterday, uh, Friday, I, uh, my entire covenant group drove, drove down to Fort Lauderdale to be with our friend Brett because some stuff going on with him. And that was a powerful moment to, to say, hey, you, you are not alone. Do it together, right? And then the story, so the armor bearer and Jonathan gets up there. <laughs> the story is Jonathan starts killing and I know, killing's a bad thing and all of that, well, you know, but you love Game of Thrones, so. And the armor bearer, evidently, after the first guy falls, the armor bearer's smart enough to pick up a sword, too. And then something starts to happen. And the Philistines are like, whoa, what's going on, what's going on? And then the Israelites on the other side wake up. And they're like, hey, what's going on? And if you keep reading the story, they go, oh, it looks like Jonathan, your son, left. And they're doing something over there. And it says that all the Israel army the like, goes and a rout takes on. You know why? Jonathan did something. All, when, when people begin to demonstrate God's love and to God's grace, when we begin to show that in the world around us, and what is God calling you to do? Just do it. Do something. Do anything. Right? And I know, I know, uh, Scott, you need a plan. You're right. Uh, it was funny. I was talking to somebody uh, uh, Wednesday night about our, our Western expansion project. We're talking about doing something out west, about what are we going to do out west? I don't know. I mean, we, I, I, I know we need to put God's love out there in a Methodist way, Wesleyan way. What's your plan? We're working on it. Uh, I got a call from the pastor of uh, Stewart Memorial, United Methodist Church, this week about, hey, I know y'all said y'all wanted to get together. I've been pushing on doing some stuff. And he said, hey, I got my group. When can we meet, right? All right, what's our plan? I don't know. But you just know sometimes there are things you need to do, and as you jump into it, then you, I know we need to, wait a minute, that's not a good use of resources, we've got to have everything planned out, you've got to do this. Thursday night I was doing, I was talking about this moment, I looked over there, was Steve Miller from New Start, and I was talking to Steve, I looked at Steve, and I went, Steve, when you started this New Start ministry in 1998, did you have a plan? And Steve's answer was, I don't think I have a plan now, <laughs> still, right? <laughs> but tons of lives have been impacted. Uh, by that. And that Thursday night service we started, early weekend work, we didn't, I mean, you begin to think about some of the plans that we have, some of the plans that you have for the, 
don't always work out. And then sometimes when we just start doing something to God calls us to do, we're like, wow. And somebody's like, well, yes, Scott, but before we do anything, before we jump out there and do stuff, we should pray. That's a good point. And I'll admit, I am, uh, prayer is not my go-to. Uh, that's just me, and it may, probably makes me a horrible, terrible pastor. Um, but I don't, ne- I don't ever think, all right, first thing I should do is pray. I am more the guy, if you read the uh, Daily Devotional this week, you know, the disciples are out in the boat, and they're paddling, and they're paddling, and they're paddling, and they're paddling. That is me. I'm going to work my butt off until I realize, oh, there's Jesus. Maybe I should talk to Jesus. It's just me. But I began to think about, you are right. To demonstrate love in our sphere of influence... We should be praying, God, what? So I started thinking about that. And just confession, which they tell me is good for the soul, and I'll bear my soul before you. I I pray pretty much every day. I have a prayer journal, a journal I write out my prayers. And unlike John Wesley, who they published all his, mine will be burned upon my death. (laughs) Sometimes because of what I've said in them. But also, as I kind of look through them, I'd be embarrassed for y'all to read my prayers. How petty they are. It's all about God protect me. God heal me. I got a lot of prayers about healing people. I got a lot of prayers about my boys. And lots lots of prayers about my boys and their stupidity. And why they should listen to their father. Uh, Right? And then I started thinking about First United and the prayers I have for First United. Um, I, I pray a lot for attendance and vision and resources, financial resources. Because I'll admit, I always stress about that. That's my, that's my, that's my stress. Uh, what, what's going to happen if we run out of money? What's going to happen? I'm always, people are laughing at me. I'm always convinced, you know. I love this service because it starts at 9, which means y'all start pulling, pulling in the parking lot at 9.04. Because there are some Sundays we start the service, and I'm like, well, this is it. Man, this is the service. Everything's plummeted and died today. And then you get here and say, oh, hey, balcony, how y'all doing? That <laughs> kind of stuff. And, you know, what happens if this? In Acts chapter 4, there's an event that's happened. Peter and John have been arrested. They've healed somebody. They've been proclaiming Jesus. And they get arrested. And they get thrown into jail in the Sanhedrin. The people that arrested Jesus and brought Jesus to trial, beat Jesus and sent Jesus to Pilate are now on James and uh, on Peter and John and saying, look. And they end up with this. And this is my wording. It's my paraphrase. And like, boy, don't you talk about Jesus no more. We're going to let you out. We don't want to hear you mention Jesus. We don't see you do anything in Jesus' name. And we're going to let you out because we can't keep you. So go. And then Luke writes about it this way. On their release, so they've been in prison, they've been beaten and all that. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they go back to, so the church is gathered, all the, all the people have gathered, and they've been praying and they've been praying, and Peter and John show up and say, look, it wasn't fun. They threw us in prison, we had bread and water to eat, they chewed us out, they told, and they told us not to say anything to anybody about Jesus ever again. Just, and you know, these are the guys that killed Jesus, so they got some, oh. When they, meaning when the church heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. So here's their prayer. Sovereign Lord, they said, you have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people you of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power had decided beforehand should happen. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of telling, I mean, I, there's part of me thinking God's up there going, I know. I mean, they're just outlining, hey, they've done all these bad things to us, Lord. They've done it. All this stuff has happened. Now, Lord, you should consider their threats. You see that next line? You should know what they're going to do to us, Lord. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Let me just back, can you back that up just one second for me? And enable your servants to speak your word with what? 
Yeah, did you see that? And that, that's great. Did you see what they didn't pray for? God, keep me safe. God, protect us. God, turn their spears that they pointed at us into plowshares. God, grant us. They didn't pray any of that kind of stuff. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand in the name, stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they play, prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. When was the last time you prayed a bold prayer? We are, you know, I'm called to do something. I'm called to demonstrate God's love. And, and at one point I had this list of all these things that I thought, okay, here, we can start listing out things that people could do. Uh, and I was talking about staff. Here are the bold things. Here are the things we need to know. And, and we went, you know what, that's, that's us coming up with my list. This is what I need you to do in the life of the church. When's the last time you just got out there and prayed, God, set me on fire and turn me loose? I, I actually, after kind of working on this sermon Wednesday, I tried to change my prayers to God, set your church on fire. N I mean, not literally, but that would help in some areas. I mean, over there. Um, God, set your church on fire. Set it, I mean, just turn us loose. <laughs> just hold on. Let's think this thing through. I'll pick on my, my favorite church member right now, Cameron. Hi, Cameron. I know you're not listening to me right now because I'm preaching. Because she likes the music. Did you see her dancing? And if that don't turn your heart on, something's wrong with you. Just to be free enough to do that. I loved it Thursday night. Thursday night I was like, hey, we need, you need to get up. You need to do something. And I said, when we celebrate communion day and the New Start kids who were serving communion, they got up and they raced up to the table. And I'm like, oh, okay, just hang out for a second. I'm not done yet. Right? But when was the last time you just said, I'm going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to say, hey, perhaps the Lord is going to save us. Let's go and do something. Right? And go until you get a no. And it's the reason sometimes this world questions, is there a God? It's because Christians never are bold enough to do something stupid for God. We're not willing to step out. My, myself included. Right. Pray prayers of protection, safety, and healing. God, give us enough money to keep the doors open. I want. Uh, we got. We got to plan things out so we can be. Right. I mean, like even with, like live streaming starting in three weeks. We're not ready. We don't have the right resources. Right. But but. But the digital age and presence is, is the key thing to do. We still haven't figured out how to celebrate communion via um, the internet. We're working on it. We may be the first church. We, may, we have figured out how to take the offering via the internet. We'll have a little button up there that says, click here, baby. Right? Pony, actually, maybe, maybe for you, Micah, pony up your cash right there. <laughs> right? But how do you say, I mean, we are called to demonstrate God's love in the world around us. And it's different for every one of us. How I do it and how you do it are going to be completely different. Maybe you're not the Jonathan that's going to climb up and do that. Maybe you're the armor bearer going, I'll follow you wherever you go. Maybe you're not the person who has the ability to speak in front of a group, but you have the resources to provide Maybe you're not, you know what you're good at. And even, and I'm willing to bet, there are moments in your life you realize, I should be doing this. But, you're like, what if I fail? Do you remember last week I talked about Peter who got out of the boat and walked on water? Right? And you're like, yeah, but he sank. Um, what happened after that in that story? Does anybody remember? Peter sank, and then what happened? Jesus is like, 
pulled him up. And here's what I am... Con it's not in the scripture. Matthew and Mark, they don't include it. But it told us that Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. So if he's in the boat here, he, he, it's not one step. It'd be like two, three steps. And the boat's there. And he sinks. And Jesus pulls him up. And here's what nobody in scripture... We, we record, Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And I think Peter also... I mean, Jesus put his arm around him and go, Dude, you walked on water. And we're going to walk our butt back into that boat. And sure, we all say Peter sank. But Peter also said, there was a day in my life where I told, heard Jesus tell me to come. And I stepped out of the boat. And for four steps, I walked on water because I kept my eyes on him. And Jonathan, you'll meet him one day. And they'll say, I didn't, we didn't have a sword. It was a stupid idea. But I knew God was telling us to go, so I climbed up on the mountain and talked smack to those, he, those Philistines. And wow. And Noah. Some voice told me to build an ark in a desert where there had been no rain. I don't even know what an ark is, but I started building. And David. There was this giant... And they wanted me to wear all this armor and swing this sword, but that didn't work for me, so I got five stones out of the riverbed and had my slingshot. Story after story in the Bible, it's when humanity moves, God does something. Our faith has shifted to, well, tell me what you want me to do, God, and I'll think about it and I'll pray about it and we'll see. And what if God's up there in heaven going, boy, why don't you go to you, get a no, and let's see what happens. And the world will change. You are called to demonstrate love. Would it not be awesome this week if we came back next week and you were able to tell a story of, what if you could just start a story with, it was stupid, but I was trying to share God's love and go from there. I know it didn't make any sense to do this, but I was trying to let people know God loved them and just see what happens. Because too often the church is about Sunday morning, come to me and sit and listen. When really what church should be about is being filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that consider their threats out there, Lord. You know what the threats are. And by the way, None of us are being persecuted for our faith. And if you believe that, come talk to me afterwards and we can argue. You're not being persecuted for our faith. We're not doing enough to be persecuted for our faith. We are afraid if we start talking about Jesus, our friends are going to say, oh Lord, here we go, there's the Jesus freak again. We're afraid if we start loving people who are unlovable, they may show up and sit next to us at church. And they don't look like us and talk like us. So we'll invite them to that other church. We're, God, consider the things we're afraid of. And enable your servants to demonstrate love with boldness. Because on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. And he thanks unto God. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup and gave thanks unto God. And after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the blood of Christ, blood, my, my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you should drink of it in remembrance of me. So as we come forward today in remembrance of all that God has done for us, being filled up on God's love and God's grace, that God loves you, period. So how are you going to share that with them people out there? In such a way they may look at you going, you are nuts. But that God you follow? Huh. Let's pray. God, we just ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of the bread and the cup. And consider our fears and our worries and our concerns. And don't let them stop us from demonstrating your love. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and set this church on fire. 
that we might demonstrate love to a world that knows hate, that we might give light into a world that knows darkness, that we might bring peace into a world that knows chaos, that we might share hope in a world full of despair. Consider those threats, Lord, and make us bold. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.